Welcome everybody to Katie Community Church. Glad you're with us. Hope you had a good week this past week. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, which gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves. Make sure that we're in fellowship with God by using the rebound technique, which is based on 1 John 1, 9, which says if we will confess our sins, which means to name or acknowledge our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity once again that we enjoy to be able to meet together. We pray that you will continue to help us as we continue our study throughout your word, especially today with this important subject of the excellence of faith. Help us to understand the concept from a biblical standpoint and help us to make the proper application of that information so that we can continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The excellence of faith. These verses are an ampl amplification, actually, of uh, the previous verse in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, where we have a doctrinal concept. Let me read it to you. It's, uh, this is kind of a corrected translation, so it really explains what verse 39 is saying. It says, but we are not the retreating type of believers designed for the purpose of destruction of our spiritual lives, but the doctrinal type for the purpose of doctrinal preservation of our souls for the execution of the Christian way of life. I think we can all relate to this. We are growing believers. We are here because we want to grow spiritually. We want our lives to be uh, a shining light to the world for Jesus Christ. So we're not the retreating type of believers who end up in a state of reversionism and ignore doctrine and ignore God and his word because that destroys our soul. But we are the doctrinal type. We want to know what God's word says so that that doctrine can be preserved, stored in our souls so that we're able to execute or live or fulfill the Christian way of life. We do that through faith. Without faith, the Bible says it's impossible to please God. So let's talk about the excellence of faith. I get this from Hebrews chapter 11 and also chapter 4. We're going to look at verses in both those chapters related to this subject. The first three verses of Hebrews uh, are faith. That's where the Hebrews 11 is often called the faith chapter. It gives if you read the chapter, it gives a list of all these Old Testament believers who, uh, through faith, were able to please God. So this sets it up, the first three verses of Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the assurance, which means it's the title deed or the confirmation of things hoped for. Now, we just studied the excellence of hope, so that should be fresh in your mind. The things hoped for, those things that are divinely guaranteed, guaranteed by God, and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, the conviction in your soul of the reality of those things that have not been seen, that cannot be seen. Faith actually comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Remember, faith is something that every human being uses to understand the world around them. 
They also use rationalism and empiricism. They can reason it out. It makes sense. Well, God makes sense. And his word makes sense. Jesus Christ himself fulfilled 333 prophecies about him in the Old Testament written from 1500 to 800 to 1500 years before he ever appeared on the scene as a human being. This is assurance. Assurance is actually the same word as faith in the Greek language. It's the word pistis. Assurance is therefore faith in believing the word of God. You must, as a believer, if you're going to grow spiritually, you must have confidence that the word of God is exactly what it says. The word of God, his word to the human race. Because that's where the information is that we need in order to fulfill our Christian lives. And whether you seek assurance for your salvation or assurance of God's provision for your spiritual life, guess where it's found? It's found in the word of God. And that's the only place that it is found. So... When we talk about faith, we're talking about the reality of things promised in God's word, because that's based on God's faithfulness, not some human being's faithfulness. Remember that the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired men to write this Bible, the doctrine that we find in the Word of God, was written by the Holy Spirit through the agency of human beings. But it's still God's Word to us. And the only way we will have full confidence or full assurance in those things which we hope for that are outlined in Scripture is through the knowledge of what God has said and believing what God has said. That's what faith is. That's why you, it's impossible. That's why it's impossible to please God apart from faith. You must believe who God is and what he has done to prepare us as human beings and as Christians to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to him. You cannot do it apart from knowledge of the word of God and application of that knowledge. That's why so many Christians fail to live their spiritual lives is because they have no knowledge of scripture. The word of God was written for us to understand. The idea that the quote-unquote common believer who's sitting in the pew can't understand what the preacher has learned in Bible college and seminary is an erroneous idea. Of course, anyone can learn the Word of God if they're taught properly in a systematic way so that they can understand the Word of God. And remember... The Word of God interprets itself. That's why I've been sending you these salvation verses. Because I want you to have full assurance in your salvation. And that what you believe is correct. There's over 150 of these verses in the New Testament alone. And you'll notice those verses, they all say, believe, believe believe. You'll see none of those verses that say believe and do good works for salvation. The Bible does not teach that. Salvation is by faith, belief, and belief, faith alone in Jesus Christ alone and what he did for us on the cross. So the evidence of things not seen 
is the conviction of their reality. It means proof or persuasion. Bible doctrine is the proof. It's the persuasion of all that you cannot see regarding God and his plan. That's where we find it. But you know it's true because God backs it up in his word. And we know it historically from historical facts. We know it from archaeology. We know it from science. All these point to the truthfulness of the word of God for us to believe the excellence of faith. It proves that all spiritual reality is found in only one place, and that is in the word of God. As believers, we look at things which are unseen and eternal, yes. And how do we do that? We do it by faith. But the more accurate doctrine that we learn and apply, the more real the things of God become. That's what gives us that conviction of reality, that what God has said in his word is absolute truth. And by the way, that's the only place you can find absolute truth is in God's word. Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 11 says, For by this, this kind of faith, the men of old gain divine approval. So it's not just for the church age. Faith began the moment that Adam and Eve were created. Because Adam had to believe God. Eve had to believe God. Ultimately, that's what their failure was. They didn't believe God. And it's only through faith that you can gain God's approval. You can please God. Believers in the Old Testament, they didn't have the completed canon of Scripture. They didn't have the Bible all in one book like we have. And keep that in mind because that's important. Because we're going to, I'm going to say something about that here in a minute. But the Word of God was still available to them. There's never been a generation that has lived on this earth for which God's Word was not available. Believers in the Old Testament gained approval of God by means of the application of Bible doctrine as they knew it, just like we do. They received divine approval through the application of Bible doctrine, which took faith. They had to believe it. Gaining divine approval meant they were living their spiritual lives as it was revealed to them at that time. Theirs was different than ours, but they still had a spiritual life. So here's the application that I refer to. This is what we're leading up to. Until the time of Moses, there was no written doctrine at all. Moses wrote the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. It's called the Pentateuch. But until the time of Moses, there was no written doctrine at all. It was always communicated by some person. If the believers in the Old Testament could reach spiritual maturity, and they could, without having the amount of doctrine that we have in the royal family, because we have a lot more. We have the mystery doctrine of the New Testament, the new age in which we live called the church age. If they could live their spiritual lives and reach spiritual maturity without the amount of doctrine that we have today, here's the point. Then there is no excuse for any of us failing to reach it, to reach spiritual maturity. God has given us everything that we need. We lack nothing when it comes to reaching spiritual maturity. The one thing that keeps us from doing that is lack of faith. Because if you truly believe 
God in his word, then you are going to want to advance in the spiritual life. You're going to use your free will to make the decision to learn God's word and then apply God's word. It's not enough just to know the word of God. You must use it. Otherwise, it does you no good. Verse 3 says, by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds, the universe, the ages, were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their real intended purpose by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are invisible. God spoke this world into existence. Jesus Christ himself is the creator. All things were created by him and for him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He spoke the world into existence. What is that? It is the word of God. Believing what the Bible teaches about creation and gives believers, should give believers, more confidence in God and his word. If a person believes the Bible, they cannot believe the theory of evolution like the Big Bang Theory, that's one of them. They're not compatible. God is the one who spoke the world into existence. In the beginning was God, and um, as the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? He spoke them into existence. The Bible is... It, the Bible is a, not a book of science, okay? And I don't mean to imply that. It's not. But it does speak about science. And when it speaks about science, it's always accurate. Did you know that the Bible says that the, word, the world is round? And at the time that that was written, that there were all kinds of theories about the world, mostly that it was flat, and that if you went too far, you'd drop off the edge of it. The Bible said it's a circle. Did you know that the Bible says that there's a blank spot in the north in the universe? The black hole, as we call it. And many other scientific facts. But it's not a book of science. It's a spiritual book. But we can have confidence in it because the Bible is always accurate, whatever it talks about, whether it is science or whether it's history. So our faith in God is solidified by the accuracy of what the Bible says about history and about science. Therefore, we can have complete faith in the power of the creator of the universe when it comes to handling any situation. If God, Jesus Christ specifically, can speak the world into existence, what can he do for you and me? Anything, anything that we need, he can handle it. Therefore, we can have complete faith in the power of the creator of the universe when it comes to handling any situation we find ourselves in. This is the excellence of faith as a problem-solving device, the faith rest technique, believing what the Bible says. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, He gives a kind of a um, outline of those who reject God 
and the reason that they reject God. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth. What does that mean? It means they are lacking faith. They don't believe the truth. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. What does that mean? It means that every human being has a conscience. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse. God has revealed himself to the human race. None of us have a, an excuse for not believing that there is a God, that he exists, that he cares about you, that he has a plan for you, and that he has revealed himself to you. And of course, he's revealed himself also in the person of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 4, the first three verses of that chapter. Verse 1, therefore, let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, we have a promise, the faith rest promise, any one of you should seem to come short of it. This is a chapter that is talking about the children of Israel wandering for 40 years in the wilderness when they had only a two week journey if they had done exactly what God told them to do, but they didn't. Why? Because they lacked faith. They didn't believe God. They grumbled, they moaned, they groaned. Everything that God did for them, he gave them heavenly food in the, in, uh, called manna. They rejected it. They said, send us back to Egypt. We want to be back in Egypt, in slavery, so that we can eat leeks and onions. Fear means to be aware or to be cautious. What you ought to be aware of as a believer in Jesus Christ, what you ought to be afraid of or cautious of is going into a state of reversionism. That should be your worst nightmare, is rejecting God and his truth. Promise refers to the promise of entering into the rest of God, faith, rest. Remains means to neglect, to leave behind, or to leave unclaimed. So when the writer of Hebrews, who I believe was the Apostle Paul, but it's not totally confirmed, says, therefore, let us fear, let us be aware, let us be cautious. While a promise remains of entering into his rest, God has promised a rest, a relaxation in your life that can only be found through the application of his word. Any one of you should uh, come short of that. So all of God's promises, all of God's blessings come through the knowledge and application of his word. Accurate Bible doctrine. Failure to learn that doctrine and apply that doctrine means a believer will fall short of obtaining that faith rest, that relaxed mental attitude. Are you relaxed about the world around you? Are you in a state of stress, anxiety over what's going on in your life or in the world around you? Things are not going to improve in Satan's world system. 
as we get closer and closer to the rapture of the church, when we meet the Lord in the air, which could happen at any time, by the way, things are going to worsen. Satan is on the rampage. He wants to do everything that he can do to discredit God by discredit, discrediting you. He wants to keep you from living your spiritual life. He wants you to be a failure as a Christian. Rest in the Greek word, uh, in the Greek, uh, the Greek word, katapasis, means causing to cease or to repose or relax spiritually. It is rest based on complete, total, and utter faith in God. Is that your attitude? Is that your mindset? Is that what you think? Do you completely, utterly, totally depend upon God every breathing moment of your life? None of us is perfect. I realize that. But we still can depend upon God. Even when we commit a sin, we can, we can depend upon God to forgive us by using the rebound technique and staying in fellowship with him a maximum amount of time. Keeping short accounts. When you realize you've sinned, confess that sin, name that sin, acknowledge that sin to God, and you're right back in fellowship immediately. That's total, complete, utter dependence upon God. When this verse that was written here in Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore let us fear lest, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. Well, that that word, those words actually should seem, or one word, the K-O, they mean to have human viewpoint. Because that's how you come short of God's rest. Because you're not thinking divine viewpoint. If you're thinking divine viewpoint, you're applying your faith to the promises of God. You're utilizing the, pro the problem-solving devices to solve problems. And God doesn't want you to miss out on the spiritual life. He doesn't want you to come short, which means to fail to attain a goal, to be below standard or to default. You don't want to default on your Christian life, do you? Of course not. That's what the reversionist does. They default, they fail to attain God's goal goal of a relaxed mental attitude. That's why I always tell you the most miserable people on the face of the earth are not unbelievers. They're believers because they have brought upon themselves self-induced misery and divine discipline. How can you possibly be in a state of relaxation, happiness, peaceful when you are experiencing the divine discipline from God. It's impossible. So even those believers who put on a happy face but are not living their spiritual lives have great turmoil within themselves. Verse 2 of chapter 4 of Hebrews says, For indeed we have Good news. We've had it. We've had the good news preached to us. Just as they did also. Talking about the children of Israel. Moses was one of the greatest communicators of the messages from God that has ever lived. As I said, he wrote the first five books of, of the uh, Old Testament. And he was constantly preaching to them God's message. 
For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, Paul, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says, just as they also, but the word preached did not profit them. Why didn't it profit them? Why doesn't it profit us? Because it was not united, mixed with their faith by those who heard it. It's a reference to the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness, as I said, 40 years. Think about it. They had a two-week journey, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of faith. And the ultimate happened to them, the ultimate curse, if you will. They did not enter the promised land. Do you realize that? That Exodus generation, that generation of people who left Egypt, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, did not enter the promised land. Even Moses did not, because there was a point where his faith failed him. And instead of believing what God had told him to do, he did what he wanted to do. And it kept him from entering the promised land. Very sad, actually, if you think about it. The Greek word for profit means to help or to benefit. There was no benefit. They wandered for 40 years and didn't believe God, rejected God, grumbled, moaned, groaned, everything. And the result was they didn't get the benefit. They didn't get the blessing that was promised to them because they rejected it. And how did they do it? By lack of faith. They had doctrinal teaching. Some of the best that's ever been given by Moses. But they were guilty of negative volition. They used their free will to say no. And they neglected their spiritual lives. The same problem existed when Hebrews was written, and it exists today in the church age. The believer's attitude toward God's word has always determined whether a believer is going to be blessed or cursed. So they, you know, we, we bring this cursing upon ourselves. The Greek word for profit means to help or benefit. So they didn't profit from what they were taught. They refused to apply their faith to the promises of God, which is the meaning of it was not united in faith. They didn't mix those promises of God with their faith. They didn't believe them. God was extremely upset and disappointed with the Israelites because he had provided for them, as he does for us, everything they needed, but they refused to accept it. Instead, they grumbled and complained and ended up being forbidden from entering the promised land, a land which God had pre prepared for them, a place of peace and tranquility or rest because of their lack of faith in the provision of God. So we need to check our faith monitor, see where we're at. Are we believing God in every, every circumstance? Or are we rejecting God? Are we allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to develop the character of Jesus Christ in our lives through the study and application of his word? Or are we just going through life thinking human viewpoint and trying to solve our own problems and seeking happiness in all the wrong places? instead of seeking God's happiness and sharing his happiness. And how do we share his happiness? Through the knowledge of his word and believing what it says through faith. Verse three of Hebrews chapter four says, for we who have believed entered that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, my disappointment, 
they will not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. God's plan began in eternity past for them, for us, for those in the future who will believe in Jesus Christ. Now, the generation that was born during the wilderness, the 40 years, those who were 20 years old and younger, or so, entered into the rest. They entered into the promised land, but those who came out of Egypt did not, with the exception, as I said, of Joshua and Caleb. The principle of faith, it's never changed. It's been the same from Adam up, up until right now. Everything that a person has ever learned is based on faith. For faith to be effective, it must have the right object. God's rest can be entered into when the object of faith is God in his word. The content of what you're thinking is what determines faith's effectiveness in your life. So faith is thinking. There's no limit to the amount of faith that a believer can have, but doctrinal content in your soul is what de determines how strong your faith is going to be. If you have little or no doctrine in your soul, you're going to have little or no faith in God and his word. That's why we need to keep pouring doctrine into our soul, not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but every chance we can pour doctrine into our soul. It's available. None of us have an excuse for not studying God's word. That rest that he's talking about means resting in God's promises, which result in a relaxed mental attitude toward the circumstances of life. Therefore, a relaxed mental attitude in life for a believer is the application of the faith rest technique. Mixing the promises of God with your faith, reaching a doctrinal rationale. If God is for us, who can be against us? And reaching a doctrinal conclusion. God is working all things together for my good. Because I love him. God is always on our side, working out things on our behalf. So you can relax, knowing God has your back. Just as he said, introduces the quotation from Psalm 95. When he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Here's here's what Psalm chapter 95, 10 and 11 say. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation and said they are people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Why didn't they know his ways? Because of lack of faith. They didn't believe what Moses was teaching. Therefore, I swore in my anger my disappointment, my indignation, they certainly shall not enter my rest. I swore means to promise a solemn oath. In my wrath is used for indignation. God was disappointed with the chosen people, Israel, his chosen people, as they continued to reject him as they wandered in the wilderness. In the same manner, God is disappointed with believers during the church age when they, quote unquote, wander in the wilderness of reversionism. Reversionism means you have rejected God for a prolonged period of time. Being carnal is something all of us experience. That just simply means we're out of fellowship with God temporarily. But reversionism means you got a habitual nature that commits certain sins. And the main sin that you commit is rejecting God and his word. 
and that gets you farther and farther and farther away from God and farther and farther away from his rest. Therefore, you can't have a relaxed mental attitude because you have no doctrine to apply to your situation. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of, his, of the world. His work, work referred to the divine provision of grace known as the divine decrees. God decreed certain things to be true of you as a believer in Jesus Christ. God loves to demonstrate to Satan, and he can do it through your life, that he can take care of the members of his family. And he certainly can, if you will allow him to do so. His grace provisions take care of believers in every dispensation. I don't care if it was before the age of Israel, during the age of Israel, during the hypostatic union when Christ was here on this earth, or during the church age or the millennium, it doesn't matter. God's provision are for all of his children, his entire family. And Satan cannot offer anything even close to what God has provided. They do not equal the provisions of God. But here's the good news, okay? This is the way we're going to wrap this lesson up. Believers don't have to wait until they reach heaven to enter God's rest. The excellence of faith, using your faith, believing the word of God, applying the word of God, allows us to enter into God's rest right this minute. What am I saying? I'm saying relax, believers. Relax. Do not get on a guilt trip. Do not beat yourself up over your failures. Do not dwell on past failures. Do not be fearful, full of anxiety and worry about what's going on in the world around you. Jesus Christ controls history. And if you will allow him to do so, God the Holy Spirit will control your life, your thinking, so that you can enter into a rest that is beyond compare, that you can relax about things going on around you, knowing God is in total and complete control of the situation. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the excellence of faith. Help us to really be appliers of your word and not just doers only, that we may really apply our faith to everything that we know, everything that we've learned, all the doctrine that we've stored in our souls, just waiting there for us to reach out and take hold of and use our faith to believe and problem solve in our lives and relax knowing that you work all things together for our good. We thank you for this. We thank you for that promise from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Help us to be wise in applying that to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sam.